Hello and welcome to the Fabers Members Live Fiction Showcase featuring six of the most exciting voices in contemporary fiction from 2020 and 2021. Our authors tonight are Ingrid Passard, DBC Pierre, Una Mannion, Rebecca Watson, Sam Byers and Leone Ross. My name is Joy Francis, I'm Executive Director of Words of Colour Productions and it gives me great pleasure to be your host for tonight's event. Each author will read a five minute extract from their book and all books featured tonight will be available for sale or pre-order from Foils Online. So, I want to introduce our first author, Ingrid Passard. We'll, be, we'll read from her debut novel, Love After Love, described by Marlon James as an unforgettable symphony of love and loss, heartache and guilt, and the secret and lies that pull us together and tear us apart. Ingrid won the Commonwealth Short Story Prize in 2017 and the BBC National Short Story Award in 2018. She read law at the LSC and was an academic before studying fine art at Goldsmith and Central St. Martins. Her writing has appeared in Granta, Prospect, The Guardian, The Independent and The National Geographic. I'd like to invite Ingrid now to read an extract from Love After Love. Hi. Thank you, Joy. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a little, little uh, difficult through this interface, but um, uh, just imagine we're all together uh, enjoying an evening of uh, storytelling. So I'm going to read from Love After Love, which is uh, my novel, and it's a story set in Trinidad, told in three voices, Betty, uh, a young widow, her son Solo, and uh, their lodger, Mr. Chayton. And it's, um, it's a story of uh, people coming together um, to form a family and how that family is disrupted by um, a little too much rum and, and some secrets being revealed and how they might find each other and themselves. I'm gonna read two extracts. The first is from the first chapter of the book and it's told in Betty's voice. And she's talking to her husband, Sunil. In two twos, I dished out the stew chicken, vegetable rice, and green salad. Sunil used the fork like it was a shovel. When he's like this, anything can become an argument, and any argument can become a fight. Like salt cheap. But I hardly put salt in the food. He rocked back in his chair if looks could kill. You telling me you cooked this chicken and didn't put one set of salt in the pot? Silence. So what I taste in? Something must be wrong with my mouth. How I taste in salt so? You know my pressure high and you giving me salt? Like you want to kill me, eh? I was careless. I'd left the rolling pin on the drain board, easy reach of Sunil's chair. That rolling pin might have hit the wall or the bed or the chair, but it found me. Doctor said the ulna and the radius snapped in two. My arm was in a cast when we buried Sunil a week later. At the funeral, I told people it was no big deal. I must stop being so careless with ladders. But I took half and left half. People used to look at me and Sunil and say, Betty Gill? You're real lucky. In my head, I wanted to ask if they're making joke. Lucky? That man only gave love you could feel. He cuff you down? Honeymoon. He give you a black eye? True love in your deal. He break your hand? A love letter. He put you in hospital for a week? Love will stay the course. He take a knife and stab your leg? Until death to us part. The second extract is, extract is in Miss Chayton's voice. Um, it's more cheery. And um, it is from the day that he moves in with Betty and a very young solo. 
Miss Betty declared she was leaving the gentleman to sort out everything and going to take her five minutes. Solo put himself in charge of settling me into the house. I was trying to unpack, but the boy kept calling me. Could he show me his room? Two minutes later, he wanted to explain how to operate the TV. I had barely packed a drawer when he demanded I inspect the kitchen. What to do? He was only being friendly. Solo showed me everything, down to turning on the water heater if there wasn't enough hot water in the pipe. He was a completely different child from the morning they had stopped to give me a drop. A right little chatterbox. Mr. Chaitan, is that the last box you're bringing up? Yes, you stay. There's nothing else to bring. Ouch, oh, jeez, and please, that hurt. I had stumped my so-and-so too on the sharp edge of the concrete step. Books tumbled out the box I was carrying. A torchlight went clanking down the steps. Solo rushed to help. You're all right, Mr. Chetan, you're all right? My toe, damn, that nail going to turn blue. I hit it and then the torch dropped on top of it. The boy ran after the torch and scooped up the books. You want ice to put on your toe? Don't worry, I'll manage. These steps are very dangerous. My daddy fell down these same steps and died. Right here. For true? Right here? I don't remember anything because I was small, but I know he fell down. I'm sorry. Sometimes he used to drink, get drunk, and fall down. You mustn't say that about your father. But mommy told me that happened. I hoped Miss Betty wasn't listening. Her window was open, so unless she was sleeping hard, she must have heard. Children these days. I'm sure your father was a good man. Just please be very, very, very careful on the steps, okay? Especially if you come home drunk. You're not going to see me drunk. I take my caribou a stag now and then, but I'm not a drinker. And Solo, you must be careful on the step too. If I knew about your daddy's accident, I wouldn't have let you run up and down with boxes. I'm accustomed to these steps. Nothing will happen to me. He bent down and picked up a large plastic bag. A boy in my class said he does thief carry beer from the fridge and drink it in the backyard. I hope you never do that. Mommy said that's the one thing she will give me licks for. I could do anything but that. It took the both of us till evening to put everything in place. Of course, I could have done it all much faster, but Solo refused to leave my side. I didn't mind, and although the boy's blabbing nonstop, half the time he's muttering to himself. At dinner, Miss Betty acted like she hadn't heard what Solo said about his father. Still, it bothered me. People like to run their mouth, especially when it's nothing to do with them. No, I wouldn't want that for these two. About half past eight, I asked Solo, please, let's knock off for the day. What wasn't put away could wait. Solo, you can help me again, but not too early. It's Sunday tomorrow. Okay, I won't come in your room and wake you up then. Before you go, come let me whisper something in your ears. He smiled and came close. You mustn't go around telling people that your father used to drink. It doesn't sound nice, especially since he's passed. And it will make your mommy cry. He leaned into my ear and whispered back. My mommy wouldn't cry for that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ingrid. That was so vivid. You just brought those characters to life and Betty and Solo just sounds I, just so endearing. So thank you. I'm sure uh, the Faber members have lots to say in relation to that. So please feel free to leave some comments. So thank you again, Ingrid. Uh, our next author is DBC Pierre, who will read from his latest novel, Meanwhile in Dopamine City, a dazzling satire of family family and technology in the 21st century, which was shortlisted for the Goldsmith Prize 2020. P 
Pierre is the author of Ludmilla's Broken English, Lights Out in Wonderland, and Vernon God Little, which I think everyone knows, uh, which won the Man Booker Prize, the Whitbread Prize for Best First Novel, the Bollinger Woodhouse Everyman Award, and the James Joyce Award. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Pierre to read an extract from Meanwhile in Dopamine City. Thank you. This is The Madness. This is uh, essentially a book about a single father trying to withhold a smartphone from his youngest child, knowing that it will throw their life into immediate disarray. And so he's on the verge of the future. Being that we live now in the smartphone world, uh, all voices are equal. And this is a book full of voices. And I want to read you two voices from different extremes. First is an eminent professor speaking to Silicon Valley type entrepreneur about his digital product. He says, Follow me, Cornelia. You're someone who works with algorithms. Look carefully. What would a student ask? Uh, I don't know. I mean, if the axes forming those shapes are coming from complex opinions and not simple trigger words, why so many? You see, she sucked her cigar till it glowed like a gem. And I'll tell you, people are receiving are receiving different data, they're being targeted individually. They have clicked, and liked, and favorited themselves into their own hermetic worlds, where they receive what an algorithm gives them. They're forming ever smaller tribes, hatred with hate, lovers with love, the obese with diet. But what makes them loop? There must be another axis. Mass human nature makes them loop. Whoever got a rush from making heroes of race can only match it now by cutting them down. The man was silent. The professor went on. You see the future before your eyes, flowering. Look at it. Big issue. And it's not technology. Oh, no, no, no. Neuropsychology en masse. The madness of crowd. So I ask you now. What other pubertal stuff were you thinking for with my absence? The other end of the spectrum, we have the voice of someone who has just discovered that someone they don't like very much at all has died. And it now falls to them to compose a tweet. Oh my God. Oh my god 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 damn what can i put what can i put what can i put what can i put person damn this is like way beyond sad fishing oh my god what can i put you have to help me like now this is live i could end up on the news or like today or like this is really it wait 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 okay Beloved Jakey, our love was so young. The stars fell from the sky for me, except now you're just gone. Except I'm damn. Wait, wait. And now you're just done. No, no, damn. Oh, Jakey. Our love was so strong, but now, like a fallen star in heaven, you're just gone away from our love bay. Damn, Kirsten, help me. God damn it. Okay, no, wait, wait, wait. My dear beloved Jakey, our love was so young. Now it went to heaven to shine like a sun. Yay! You back to your regularly programmed show. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre. 
well, we're engulfed, surrounded, absorbed by virtualness and technology. And so, you know, here and around the technology, Twitter and mobile phones, I can imagine, you know, we're just hankering after simpler times. So thank you, Pierre. Our third author, author is Una Mannion, who'll be reading from her debut novel, A Crooked Tree, to be, hi, Una. I'm just reading through your, your, your bio, but yes, keep me company while I do that. A Crooked Tree to be published in January 2021. So, you know, I'm sure you're gonna to wanna to pre-order after she, she reads. And it's been hailed by Kirkus, a suspenseful, affecting, and disarmingly evocative of childhood and the not so distant era of the 1980s, which has come back again. Um, Una was born in Philadelphia and lives in County Sligo Island. She has worked, won numerous prizes for her work, including the Hennessy Emerging Poetry Award and the Doolin, Anningham and Ambit Short Story Prizes. Her work has been published in the Irish Times, The Lonely Crowd and Bear Fiction. Una also edits the Comorant, a broadsheet of prose and poetry. Welcome, Una. I'm going to hand over to you now to set the context for the extract you're going to read for us. Thank you, Joy. And I'm, I'm sorry that I dropped in too, too soon. Um, I'm going to read from um, my novel, A Crooked Tree. And A Crooked Tree is set outside Philadelphia in the summer of 1981. It is about a large Irish American family who have recently lost their father. And the mother is um, sort of emotionally unavailable or, and detached from the family with their own secrets. The book focuses on the children in the family and their efforts to protect one another. I think hold on to an idea of their father and each and an idea of them, and maybe even a, an idea of America, um, despite things that are are um, rupturing rupturing those ideas. Um, I'm going to read a, a kind of compressed version of the very first chapter. Um, in the, fir the opening scene, the, the family are driving in a car and the mother does makes a decision. She does something that um, has unintended consequences. And the result of that is um, really the catalyst um, for, the, for the remainder of the novel. Um, so. The night we left Ellen on the road, we were driving north up 252, near where it meets 202 and then crosses the Pennsylvania Turnpike. To the west were open fields, stretches of golden prairie grass and butterfly weed, the final line of sun splintering a light through them. To the east, King of Prussia, gray industrial sites cast in dusk, cement trucks, cranes, and a maze of highways and expressways. We drove, cars switched on headlights, and straight ahead, the hills of Valley Forge had become shadows, the trees already dark silhouettes. The six of us were in the car, Maria up front in the passenger seat, Ellen between me and Thomas in the back, and Beatrice lying in the way back with all our school bags and work folders. It was the last day of school, and we were officially was driving, erratically, she hit the brakes, accelerated, revving high in first gear before shifting. She was angry. I could feel it in the car's sickening motion, and from the seat behind, could see it in glimpses of her jawline, how it moved and twitched under the skin, even when she wasn't speaking. She and Ellen had been arguing, Ellen pestering her about going to an art camp that summer. I told you no, that's enough. She caught a promotional blackmail, sending home brochures and school bags, and it infuriated her. I pressed my forehead against the window and looked toward that final thread of gold. Outside, dogwoods lined the understory where the woods met the fields, and even in the falling light, I could see they were stripped of their bloom. Cornice Florida, clustered flowers surrounded by bracts that people mistake as the petals. My father had bought me the field guide to the trees of North America, the last Christmas before he died. I'd read and reread the book, committing to memory every tree fact I could. His gift had arrived in a package with a postmark from New York City, where he'd gone to live working with a cousin, an Irish immigrant like himself. He'd gotten us each a card. For me, a forest of spruce, one tree separated out in front with a star on top. 
His handwriting was small and uneven, as if he weren't used to signing cards, which I guess he probably wasn't. For Libby, always in a tree, Merry Christmas, love Dad. I don't know if I've spent so much time with trees because I loved them or because of how much he loved them. He loved me loving them, and I cannot separate these things. Next to me in the car, Ellen was still bent over, the bones of her spine visible beneath her school pinafore. A little sprite, my Aunt Rosie had said when she came from Ireland for my dad's funeral. She'd sent us food packages and at Christmas a bottle of sherry to improve Ellen's appetite. Ellen was small. At 12, she was just over four feet and only 60 some pounds. Looking at her now, she seemed so tiny and unhappy and I tried to pat her back. Get off, she mumbled and shoving me, banged the back of the driver's seat. My mom swerved the car toward the verge and back onto the road again, exaggerating the power of Ellen's knock against her seat. You could kill us doing that, do you understand? You can vacuum the downstairs when you get home. No, I won't, Ellen said. You should make Beatrice do something for once. Leave her out of this. I could see my mother's large hair bun and just one eye in the rear view mirror as she looked back at Ellen. You hate all of us and you love just her and your fat boyfriend. Ellen was going too far. I elbowed her to make her stop. One more word and you'll walk. It's true, you hate us. Ellen was shouting, you hated dad and I hate you. The car skidded into the shoulder right where 252 crossed the turnpike. Out, get out. My mom said it with her voice low, which let us know she meant it. Ellen reached across Thomas, opened the back door and started to climb out. You can't leave her here, Marie said, it's getting dark. She started to gather her bag from the floor of the front. Ellen was standing on the gravel verge, the over sorry, also, Ellen was standing on the gravel verge of the overpass in her school pinafore, tennis shirt, and knee socks. Marie was opening her door when my mother threw the car into gear and accelerated forward. I looked back. Ellen was facing away from us, looking down over the bridge where columns of cars funneled along the turnpike. Mom, don't, please, Thomas said but she didn't answer. We sped up 252 into the National Park and then turned west toward Valley Forge Mountain where we lived. Ahead of us, the sun had fallen below the fields. We were still five or six miles from home. I hadn't said anything to make my mother stop. We careened down the road, went through the covered bridge, past farmland and fences. Beside us, the shadows of dogwoods blurred in the dark as my mother kept driving, each tree hemmed in a halo of white where the bracks had fallen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Una. That was gripping and incredibly tense. And you just left us with a cliffhanger there. Um, thank you. Wow, that was amazing. Um, next up is Rebecca Watson, who will read from Little Scratch, which will be published in January 2021, which author Sophie McIntosh describes as wry, funny, and heartbreaking. Rebecca Watson is Assistant Arts Editor at the Financial Times. Her work has been published in the Times Literary Supplement and Granter. In 2018, she was shortlisted for the White Review Short Story Prize. So I'd like to now welcome Rebecca to read an extract from Little Scratch. Hi, um, so I'm going to read from Little Scratch, which tells the day in the life of a woman in her 20s, from when she wakes up to when she goes to bed. Uh, it's inside her head, no stopping. Uh, she gets up, she goes to work, but underneath the routine, there's something else going on. She's suppressing an experience of sexual assault and it splinters and speeds up her thoughts and turns her neurotic. Um, I'm going to read an extract that begins at the almost exact middle of the book. It's her lunch break. Uh, she's just gone upstairs to the office canteen to buy some lacklustre soup. Uh, she's settled in a little nook where she likes to sit and eat her lunch without being interrupted. Um, but the extract begins just as our colleague has walked past and caught her eye, ready to disrupt her peace. Eye contact already made. Him, mouth open. Hello. Haven't seen much of you. It's been a while. What have you read recently? Mind gone. Not a clear head, but a blank head making me question my capacity to think at all, even though I know that questioning my capacity to think is thinking in itself, but a different sort and 
not the sort I'm interested in much. I know I was reading a book on the train this morning, and yet here I am searching desperately for any hint of a book I might have encountered. What have I read, I say, pensively, as if the choice is just too extravagant and I merely want to select the right book for my shelf that will interest him, the shelf inside my head, I mean, so that I'm not just delivering any old thing, which will only make things worse, naturally, because my head is still blank and time for rumination is running out, only implying I'm thinking over what I say so that now whatever I say should seem more intelligent. But I still see clearly the table in front of me, my legs underneath are seem to be scratched, spoon still clean, phone flashing whatsapps, green unbroken chats hiding the carefully chosen background of my phone. And I see him noticing too, looking without wanting to at my phone, flickering him to the phone and then to me to the phone, me too to the phone, him to me, phone, me, me, him. And I now can't turn the phone over, letting the back face up, because he'll know that I know and that we both know. So I let it flicker whilst I continue to think, still not in my head, seeing clearly what is in front and overhead, him standing, jutting out, signaling to those walking, like ball blinking, but the nook behind the coffee station is a noose signaling to those passing by, look in, look at the reddening girl sitting on the sofa, mouth shut. Still me, looking out, locking eyes with the him who is now cocking his head. Unimpressed. Am I applying that to his face or is he unimpressed? Legs warm. But now I see, oh boy, I see white, blue lettering, an image, not my spoon, not my phone, although I can see that too an emoji of a pig which distracts me for a second but no i'm not letting this go yes an image a book yes blue lettering that's it you're doing good it's what i read last week that will do he doesn't know the order of when i read things hmm, hard something hard castle no look let's grab the title you've got that me well i guess it's funny how you can so easily forget what you've read recently but i've yes yes it's becoming read the second body that's something, that's something. Not what I'd like to pick out for him. Have you heard of it? Quite interesting. Too millennial, it won't please him. But it's a book, he'll know I'm looking at butchers and meat, reading, engaging, and our existence on this planet. He's not interested. I can see him glossing over, and I realise as he says, oh nice, must check it out. But it was only ever a polite question. I could have said anything. Well, not anything. If I had said cloud atlas, perhaps he might have wrinkled the bridge of his nose, but really I could have gone, he's gone with anything. Slide phone, WhatsApp, my him, two ticks, still not read, me. Why is it whenever anyone asks what I've read, I go completely blank? Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Rebecca. We certainly haven't gone blank with that reading. Uh, I found her interior world very captivating. Um, and there was something poetic in how you conveyed her discomfort and her knees. Um, thank you so much for that. Our penultimate our author is Sam Byers, who will read from Come, Join Our Disease, a satire published in March. It's going to be published in March, 2021. A savvy, subtle chronicler of contemporary malaise, according to the Financial Times. Sam's writing has appeared in Granta, the New York Times, and in the Times Literary Supplement. His debut novel, Idiopathy, was shortlisted for the Costa First Novel Prize and the Desmond Elliott Prize, and was a winner of a Betty Trask Award. His second novel, Perfidious Albion, was longlisted for the RSL on Darche Prize and for the Orwell Prize for Political Fiction and shortlisted for the Encore Prize. So I'd like to now hand over to Sam Byers to read an extra and contextualise, come join our disease. Hi everyone, um, I hope you're all well and comfortable. Uh, I'm gonna read from my third novel, uh, Come Join Our Disease, 
uh, which is out in March. Um, it's about um, a woman called Maya, who at the start of the novel is living on a homeless encampment and she's detained from the encampment and um, offered the chance to join a kind of rehabilitation program, which um, gives her a job and encourages her to join like a, a wellness program and document her transformation on Instagram um, to a kind of effect productive person. But as the book goes on, she starts to chafe against those ideals and uh, em embrace us instead um, uh, a sense of um, degradation and sloth um, and decay. So I'm just going to read right from the beginning when uh, she's seized uh, on the encampment. On the worst nights, it felt as if everything encroached at once. The rain found every gap and inlet, soaking into the earth and rising back up through the strata of flattened cardboard on which we slept. The cold breached all our bundled layers, our damp and matted jumpers, our cast off coats and scavenged sleeping bags. Often, I awoke to the sound of fights outside, clumsy fingers rooting for hidden valuables, a man's boozy breath in my ear. I slept in my clothes and boots, tucked my scant cash in my sock. People who knew me left me alone. Others I had to hurt a couple of times before they learned. Dawn was always a relief. The night was over, the trials of the day not yet begun. Whatever had passed in the darkness was forgiven. For a few seconds, as the sun offered its first tentative touch and the sky on a clear day lost its blackness, and became first bruised and then bloody. Those of us that lived on the encampment, that stubborn mess of tents and lean-tos, sheets of tarpaulin and stolen boards propped against poles and trees, were briefly allowed to feel all the things denied to us in the night and through much of the day. Faint hope, tentative warmth, a moment of ease. So to all the other insults and injustices of that day, the violence of the officials' arrival, and the destruction of their passing, I must add this, that their quarters, whether deliberately or not, at our freest. I heard them before I saw them, a low hive-like hum down the road. I guessed the time at soon after six. It was early March. The morning still carried the residual chill of that year's long winter, but you could feel the promise of spring in the air. When I pushed aside the draped tarpaulin under which I slept, and rose stiffly to my feet. I saw that others had already gathered and were staring off down the road towards the deepening drone of whatever was approaching. For, for a strange still moment, it seemed like the most natural and ordinary meeting of people, a small group of neighbors, hands on hips, speculating as to what was afoot. But then the convoy rounded the bend and in an instant we were alone and scrambling, neighbors no more. The more military looking police were at the front, two vans with grills on the windows bearing black clad visored officers. Behind them were ambulances, uniformed cops and buses for whoever the task force managed to round up. Lastly came the vehicles of non-specific destruction, the JCBs and bulldozers, the skip trucks, unmarked van filled with contracted workmen in hard hats and high-vis overalls. We scattered, People ran for the piece together structures that had been their homes and began throwing things into bags, tossing aside tarpaulin down sheets, uncovering their secret cases of food, drugs. There were children in some of the tents and they began to scream, which set off the panicked barking of the encampment's dogs. As people shouted to each other, language became an irrelevance. Wherever you were from, a global shorthand was at work. Police, trucks, run. I managed my fear by cataloguing my minor advantages. I was fast, I was alone, I had attached significance to only a few small possessions. Humble comforts were a trap. You fought for something that kept you warm, but then it came to mean something to you, evolved into some meagre symbol of achievement, and you clung to it even as it slowed you down. Around me, as I began to run, too many people were making this mistake, hamstrung by what they carried, stumbling as they dropped unwieldy items under their feet. 
By this point, I'd gathered my rucksack and the little bundle of valuables at the bottom of my sleeping bag and was moving quickly. The encampment had been pieced together on a patch of waste ground, recently cleared to make way for development. A raised train track and arched bridge provided shelter on one side. Beyond that was a high fence that marked the border with a largely disused industrial estate. This was the direction in which most people were heading. Once over the fence, the empty warehouses and equipment stores, the huddled buildings and maze of units that formed the estate would offer ample opportunity to scatter and like droplets of spilled water absorbed into the earth, vanish back into the city. For a moment, the shouting, the chaos seemed to diminish. The fence was in our sights. Briefly, I glanced back at the broken down boxes on which we'd slept the scattered cans and pots from which we'd eaten. It was, I thought, a perpetual cycle. Detritus, repurposed, became possessions. Now our abandoned belongings were trash once more. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sam. Uh, all too raw and real at this time in terms of COVID, and homelessness and increasing and the lack of a solution and you know like you're touching on the importance of radicalism and resistance so thank you um last but not least i'd like to now introduce our final author who's leonie ross you will read from this one sky day which will be published in april 2021 it's essential meditation on the nature of love and addiction. And this magical and incisive novel satirizes post-colonial society and celebrates oddness. Leone is a fiction writer, editor, and academic. Her first novel, All the Blood is Red, was long listed for the Orange Prize. And her second novel, Orange Laughter Laughter, was named by Wasafir magazine as one of the most influential British novels of the last 25 years. Ross's first short story collection, Come Let Us Sing Anyway, was longlisted for the Jallet Prize and shortlisted for the Edge Hill Prize in 2018. The only senior lecturer in creative writing at Roehampton University of London, so I'd like to introduce and welcome the only who will read from this one sky day. Hello. So, Good evening. I'm really, really glad you're all here and I'm glad that you held on. And I'm going to read from a slightly odd and quite affectionate novel. Um, the thing that you really need to know in terms of me introducing the story is that this is a uh, island of poppy show and magic here is completely ordinary and bordering on boring. And something very odd has been happening to all the women today. So I'm going to read to you from chapter 18 uh, and tell you the story of a character called Santine Intasar. The very odd thing that's been happening to all the women happened to her an hour ago. It's a very embarrassing point um, in the middle of her first orgasm. So this is her an hour after the odd something has happened. Santine's hands slipped on the oars. She paused for breath, sweat on her top lip. She couldn't remember the last time she'd rowed herself and the lack of practice showed. Mid-afternoon and she still felt basted in oil, like a side of meat, gummy and furious. She rubbed her hands in her hair, along the soles of her feet, the front of her robe, and then plunged them into the ocean. The canoe rocked to the side. She was in the middle of the most frustrating experience of her entire life. Her mother had been on her as soon as she walked back into the house. There'd been no right way to lie about something this important. Where were you in that horrible moment, demanded her mother, and she was frozen. It was only when Mama Intasar tried to lift her skirt hem that Santine realized she was not the only one who'd had an accident, and none of it was her fiancé Dandu's fault. Her mother said the maid cleaning the gazebo squeaked Eep! when hers fell out and that the young wife one door down, who was sitting with her in the garden taking lemonade, said, blood fire. 
She'd had more presence of mind than anyone around her. Mama Intasar shot straight up to the house, calling for someone to find Santine, flinging her own situation into her purse for safekeeping. Then she'd remembered her one child wasn't home. I am not your one child, Mama, said Santine. Don't be ridiculous. Her mother ignored this. Where is your it that? So then Santine did have to tell. Her mother screwed her eyes very tight and held her head in her hands in a way that Santine thought ever so melodramatic. But she was used to her mother getting everything wrong. Imagine if she'd acted so dramatically when she didn't get what she wanted, which was a reasonable mother. The governor have to hear about this. Her mother had an irritating way of referring to her husband and the father of her children by his title. You mean Papa, said Santine. You know you're very out of order, Santine, ignoble. Mama went pounding at her father's office door, which was the one thing her generally sanguine father could not abide. At first, he said he really didn't want to hear all this woman business. But when more was explained, he strode out of his office, literally struggling for breath. In the midst of the yelling, Santine had given as good as she got. After all, it was she who climbed into Dundee's bedroom and she who let him look between her legs. And how was it his fault that the blasted thing had to fall out right that minute, especially now she knew it wasn't just her it happened to? Tell that boy you're coming back to get your jewel, her father bellowed. Despite her clear explanation that he felt it, she felt best with Dandu keeping it and that calling it a jewel was stupid, her father looked like he was contemplating a stroke. She felt sorry for him, so she stalked over to the phone feeling self-righteous until Dandu told her about the river. His teeth were chattering. You lost it, said Santine. She could feel her mother fluttering spasmodically like a hen before death. S slipped, stuttered Dandu. So now I'll go and kill you, said Santine. The governor's first idea after that revelation was typical. He wanted to send out very many men beating bushes and lifting up stones and invading houses. Santine glared. Review this, Papa. You're going to send out hundreds of men to look for my pum pum? What make you think that is a good idea? Which ended that stupid matter. How you could trust a credit with something so precious, yelled her father. He got very angry indeed when he couldn't solve things with money. She'd seen the safe in his office, stuffed with coins it was, and he never seemed to run out. There were neat bags stacked on the shelf, the perfect size for a bribe. He is not a crebe, she yelled back, even though she had never been angrier with a human being than she was with Dandu right now. He going to be my husband tomorrow, and if you and Mama want any grandchildren, you better try come up with something fast, because I don't have a pom pom. Then she locked herself in her room and called Dandu back and asked him what he really was thinking, taking her underneath for a walk like it was a bunch of rascal bananas. The immediate problem, as her parents saw it, was to prevent besmirchment. If no one could have sex and no one knew why they couldn't have sex, then it followed that no one would take the chance and have sex with her jewel if they found it. By the time she'd spoken, more like screamed at Dandu for the second time and hung up, Santine could hear the sex ban being announced from the radio in the house next door. Illegal, punishable by life imprisonment to indulge in carnal activity of any kind. Repeat, any kind until 2.10 p.m. tomorrow afternoon. Santine held her head like her mother had. Really, she had the most stupid parents. Fear before common sense. A government command with no explanation did nothing but set up a mystery. And what was more human than trying to solve one of those? And now this radio woman calling the house. She didn't trust her. Mama said it was good for Papa to go on the radio and just say everything was fine and talk to this lady about embroidery and children and how sad he was to see his one baby girl fly away to be a big woman on her own and tell people the color of the wedding decorations. But Santine had been listening to her for months now, and that was not a woman to be played with. She wasn't what Pap was used to, taking his money bags down to the radio station with him and chatting about the weather, then leaving them there. All the radio hosts were nice to politicians. Miss Ha might not be so nice. And Papa could not calm himself when challenged. If any man in the whole of this archipelago touch my daughter, pum pum, I go and cut him balls off, I make him eat what left. Please, gods, he wouldn't swear like that on live radio and tell everybody what was lost in a river. Santine rode just as fast as she could, 
past trees, beaches and peasant houses, pink and orange and lime, like large colourful sweets hanging in the bush. A man standing next to a yellow house made a rude gesture at her. Santine was tempted to get up and throw one of the oars at him, but then she would have only had one oar, and that would make her as stupid as everyone else today. She scratched her shoulder. Her wings itched when she was upset. What was this world coming to when a woman had to go out searching for her own pum pum? Men could not be trusted to do anything but look pretty. She set her back to it. Papa was a little bit right to be protective. Part of her body was in jeopardy after all. She hadn't told him where she was going, but on a calm day, she thought he would have approved. People said her father had overseas ways and a delivery boy's magic for speed. And what kind of inferior magic was that? They didn't know. He was a spiritual man, a deep feeling man. And he liked that she had her own mind. She wasn't sure what she would do when she found her pum pum how she might make peace with the fear, what shape it would be in, or whether Dandu would like it after it came back from its adventures. She wasn't even sure she wanted Dandu to see it again ever, having been so gut-wrenchingly careless. But she wanted it. The longer it was gone, the more she felt wrong. It belonged to her, and she should be in charge of it. If anyone knew where a pum pum had run to, it was the Obia Fatidik. So that was where she was going. Thank you. Leonie, what a way to end this live fiction showcase with the missing pom pom. Um, <laughs> and any person I know who could talk about all these matters, women's um, underneath jewels, jewels, and also sexuality and identity with such humor through the vehicle of a genre of magic realism. So I thank you. Uh, I'd like to invite all the other authors back, please. So we can see you all now in your glory after taking on such a wonderful literary journey. Oh, I love this. <laughs> the high tech, as alluded to in Pierre's book. Look, thank you all so much. Um, Ingrid, Pierre, Sam, Rebecca, Una, Leone, thank you all for your time, for your creativity, your artistry. And I want to also thank all the Faber members for attending tonight. Just to let you know, the recording will be available shortly after today. So look out for that. And just a, another sort of gentle reminder that all the books featured in tonight's event are available for sale or pre order from Foils Online. So I'd like to wish you all a great night and thank you all so much for joining us and thanks again to Ingrid Pierre, Una, Rebecca, Sam and Leone. All the rest. Thank you all. Thank you Joy. Thanks Joy. Uh, thank you.